Well, happy Sunday, y'all. How's everybody doing? Are we good? Awesome. Hey, before you sit down, uh, maybe just find a neighbor next to you, give them a high five, and tell them which college team you're most disappointed in. And if it's not Auburn, you didn't get it right. And go ahead and have a seat. Well, if you didn't say Auburn, you didn't get it right. But uh... Hey, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors. Glad y'all are here today and you found your way into the room. Um, but there are a bunch of people who are joining us for church online today as well. So would you help me welcome those people today? Thank you. Um, I always love the Sunday after Thanksgiving because um, it just feels like people are generally in a good mood. And I don't know if that's being with family or they've left now and you're like, oh boy, we can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, it's like we're kind of turning the corner towards Christmas. I got a shirt on with buttons. It's like it's a special occasion. And uh, <laughs> it's like yesterday my wife says, hey, do you have your clothes ready for tomorrow? I'm like, look, I got them ready for the rest of the year because I got like five shirts with buttons on them. And the only decisions now are which week I'm going to wear them. So you can look forward to that. But uh, just on that note, hey, we're going to start Christmas series next week, and then we're going to introduce the Christmas offering as well. So if you're on the email list, you'll hear some of that in the next couple of days. But um, if you're walking through the lobby, you will find some invite cards that look like this that say Spruced Up, which is the name of our Christmas series, as well as tie-ins to our Christmas offering. And so you can use these as invites to hand to a friend or a neighbor or a family member um, this week or the next couple of weeks. And then on the back side, it has Christmas Eve and service times for that. I told you all last week, um, just based on how things are going for us this year and the way uh, we're growing and God's blessing us with people, we're adding two additional services for Christmas Eve. So we have Saturday night options as well as the three on Sunday morning. So grab some of those and uh, just get, give one to a friend or a neighbor and invite them to come and sit with you. So uh, real quickly, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you're our guest today, thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday with us. If you didn't get a chance to connect with somebody at one of the entrances, would still love to know that you're here. You could do that on the way out or I'll give you some instructions at the end of the service if you have a few minutes for something we call 10 after. Or if you'd love to fill out the online connection card, um, you can do that through our app. If you're like, well, how do I get the app? Well, there's instructions on a card in the back of the seat in front of you. And that goes for all of you. If you're regular, the app is a great place to do a ton of things. And one of those that you'll find in there under the events section is partnership. So partnership class is this Tuesday here in the building, 6 to 7 p.m. Partnership is where we talk about the vision of the church, the mission that we think God has for us, the strategy on how we think it's going to best be accomplished, what we teach as a church, and then how you can take your next step to actually be a part of what's happening. So jump in on partnership this week. It's only an hour long. Um, it's a lot of fun. And then uh, generosity, which we do every week. So you can do all that in the app. And the generosity goes to support the mission of our church. So do that there. You can do that um, as you leave today as well. Just hand something to the ushers if you would prefer to do that. Um, you can practice that way. Um, two things, then we'll jump into the teaching today. Uh, one is communion. At the end of the message, I'm going to lead us in communion. And so um, if you're a follower of Jesus, and it doesn't matter if you're visiting from out of town or anything like that, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can participate today. And that's located in the back of the seat in front of you. You'll find a little cup. There's juice in there, something that we call a wafer-like substance on the top. And so uh, just get that ready. Uh, have that close by. The other thing is I just want you to know, and this would be something to celebrate, um, that in our first service today we baptized two people. And those were, hold on, those were uh, the 100th and 101st baptisms of the year. So that's something to celebrate. Yeah. All right, let's jump in. I, I told you all last week that we were hosting Thanksgiving this year. And so we had um, 22 people around our table Thursday afternoon. I see my neighbors, next door neighbors are here. They heard all of it happening. Um, there was 22 of us around the table. We had 13 people just living at the house for the week. And so somebody said, how's it going over there? I was like, it's like a frat party over here because <laughs> there's somebody in every room laying on every futon or on a couch. There's just like people everywhere and kids are running like crazy. And so uh, we did manage to get everyone together for some family photos, okay? And so I picked out the very best one. I just want to show you and explain who's in this picture, okay? So what we have are my wife, Chris's parents that are the ones seated in the chairs. You can see them right there. And uh, <laughs> then it's her family, okay, her two brothers, all three of our kids, 
and then four little ones. Two of them are our grandkids. So do we got the picture? So I want you to envision this, all right? And we're, <laughs> we're in some grass and there's a pond behind us. There's furniture that we've dragged out into the side of the yard as a prop. And uh, so, yeah. Um, well, that doesn't really help me. There we go. Hey. Okay, so this is all of us. This is the crew that we had uh, for the week, and it's amazing. And there's a whole list of pictures, by the way, on um, who, who needs to take what picture and who's in it and who's not in it. And so then we took a picture where it's just Chris's parents who are seated, and we took our people out of it, and we just have kids and grandkids. Uh, can we go back to that one? Because that's the real picture that I took while what really describes what was happening this week. Kids are crying and they're just laying on the ground and even one adult in the back has a frown on her face. And I'm like, this, this is the, the real scene of what happened during Thanksgiving right here. It was what we would call chaotic, which is organized chaos. It's like herding cats for most part for the week. So uh, we really had an amazing time. Um, there were no plumbing issues, nobody was injured, nothing was broken, uh, none of that kind of thing. So we had a really good time. I did have a moment yesterday, okay, while I was, um, it was just me and my wife, Chris, and everybody was gone for just a little bit of time and I'm watching college football and then I realize I'm humming the theme song to Bluey. So that's kind of how the week went. <laughs> and if you know, you know, all right? So <laughs> there you go. All right. Hey, my first um, Thanksgiving with my wife and her family um, they, we were all seated at the table and they have this dish of Indian corn and you pass it around and when it comes to you, you take out a piece and you just set it on your plate and then it just keeps going around until all of those pieces of corn are gone. And so then you've got like two or three sitting in front of you. And then we take turns and we say, hey, for every piece of corn you have, you say something you're thankful for and then you put it back into the dish and you get a variety of different answers. It could be anything, right? Hey, I'm thankful for the family, you know, I'm thankful for the turkey, thankful for Jesus and I'm thankful for football. Like these are all answers that qualify, okay? And I was just thinking about that, like, okay, well, if we passed around uh, a bowl of candy corn, okay, through, our, through the room this morning and everybody takes out one or two pieces and then we go, okay, well, you need to say something that you're thankful for. Um, some of us would go, okay, that's easy. Like I can do this. Give me a whole bowl of things, right? I'm thankful that my family was here last week. I'm thankful that my family wasn't here last week. It's, I, I'm thankful, you know, my team won this weekend. Just li life is good. Like I could do this. It's easy. Some of us would go, okay, I, I don't know. That one's going to be, a, that's a little tougher. I'm not sure I can do that. After the week I've had, right, or I don't want to go to work tomorrow, no show of hands, like we got car problems happening right now during the holidays, family's coming back for Christmas, okay, I don't know how you do that, if you only knew about the rest of my life, and anytime we do an exercise like that where people are forced to like give gratitude for something, um, there's always a part of me that goes, okay, listen, if it wasn't for a day like this where you can't eat until you say thank you, and you wouldn't be saying that right there. And then I think about myself as well, and I go, okay, well, well, would I be actually saying these things right now. So what I want us to wrestle through, before we move on to Christmas next week, I want to pause on thanks, thankfulness a little bit. And the question I want to think about is, how could we take what happens or happened around your table, hopefully on Thursday or a day like Thanksgiving, and make it a normal way to live, right? What would it look like to turn like an inspiring day or, or a weekend into to a way of life? So I want to center on one passage, okay? Just a couple of phrases from the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians, and we'll drill a little bit deeper on it in a minute. Written by the Apostle Paul, we spent a couple of weeks on him in our last series, to his friends at a church in Thessalonica. And near the end of the letter, he's kind of giving some quick sound bites, and then he writes this, chapter 5, 16. He says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Say, so, okay, here's the message, all right? All right, uh, be joyful all the time, or he says, in everything, and be grateful or give thanks all the time. So would you just kind of humor me this morning and just kind of say these words back to me this morning? Be joyful. Be joyful. Give thanks. Give thanks. All, the time. all the time. Now, that sounds like good advice. It'd be a really great thing to drink your coffee out of tomorrow, right, when it's on your mug going, oh, I love this idea. Um, but is anyone like already feeling the tension in that? Be thankful, he says, in everything, or some versions actually read, in all circumstances. Now, the way this works for most of us is, okay, well, well, if I had more good things happening in my life, then I'd probably be a more thankful person. 
And unfortunately, what happens for a lot of us is we actually intentionally set out to find something good or to have something good actually happen to us. And then we go, okay, well, that would be our search for happiness, right? So if I get that car or that house or I achieve that dollar amount or have that experience or this person, right, there's, that thing might actually bring me some happiness because we think, right, if we find something good or something good happens to us, then we will we'll just live this thankful life. And it sounds right, but you already know that it doesn't always work that way. What Paul is actually saying right here is that we have turned it around. We got it all backwards. He says really that in order to be truly joyful, I must first be deeply grateful. In other words, joy does not always produce thanks, but thanks will produce joy. Let me give you a couple of examples. Joy does not always produce Thanks, a couple of weeks ago, okay, I passed out candy, right, on Halloween to some extra greedy kids who are on a mission, if you're with me. You did this as well. I mean, I had, I had an amazing vibe going on. I had music. I was dressed as a little poor man's tribute to Jimmy Buffett. I'm playing amazing beach tunes. I've, I'm grilling hot dogs. I've passed out full-size candy bars, Okay. <laughs> I wasn't even dictating which candy bar you got. There they are. Grab one. One. Grab one and pick the one that you want. And, and I ran out of, of candy and uh, a teenage boy who's probably 15 or so who, who came up and he goes, what? You're out of candy. I said, well, look, I got hot dogs. He goes, I don't want a hot dog. He goes, but I'll take one. I'm not leaving empty handed. <laughs> I, it, was a, it was a great thing. But inevitably, okay, some parents still had to prompt some of their kids with a question, which isn't really a question, which is, hey, what do you say to the nice man? And then you get like this forced thank you, right? In other words, the good gifts that you gave out didn't necessarily produce gratefulness. But thanks, okay, will produce joy. I know this because I eat at Chick-fil-A. Anybody else? <laughs> I don't know any unhappy people that work at Chick-fil-A, by the way. I think because they say, my pleasure all day, right? And they get, can't help but smile. I, I just smile thinking about it. Um, you, you might even start working at Chick-fil-A as a grumpy, uh, ungrateful person, but you can't stay that way. Because all day long you're saying, hey, I am grateful to be serving you uh, because I get to do this. I'm reminded that I have a job. I'm getting paid because we have customers. And if I keep you happy, you'll be a repeat customer. It is my pleasure to serve you and therefore I'm happy. Now, listen to these words from a Christian author named Brennan Manning. And these are dated a little bit, but I want you to hold on and then I'll show you what's at the end. He says, I believe the real difference in the American church is not between conservatives and liberals, fundamentalists and charismatics, or between Republicans and Democrats. The real difference is between the aware and the unaware. When somebody is aware of that love, the same love the Father has for Jesus, that person is just spontaneously grateful. Cries of thankfulness become the dominant characteristic of the interior life, and here's the phrase, the byproduct of gratitude is joy. We're not joyful and then become grateful, we're grateful and that makes us joyful. I love that last part because he's saying the same thing as what Paul wrote, right? The things that we look to for happiness don't always make us grateful, but being grateful has a way of producing joy. So here's the big idea I want you to grasp for the next several moments. If you would just kind of humor me again and say it with me. If I can give thanks, I can, give thanks. I can find joy. All right. If I can give thanks, I can find joy. All right, so how do we do that in what we would call all circumstances? Because sometimes life is good, right? Sometimes life is bad, and then sometimes life is just, what would we call it? I'm going to call it ugly, all right? So hold on for a few minutes. Let's think about giving thanks in good circumstances. So there's a story in the life of David, okay? This is shepherd boy David, David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba. David was king of Israel for 40 years. And toward the end of his life, he had a desire to actually build a temple for God so that people had a permanent place to worship. Now, David's the visionary. David's the, the fundraiser. He even donated first, and then the people rallied around him, and they just gave, and they gave, and they gave. And after all the contributions have been collected, 
David stands up and he says, hey, um, before we celebrate, okay, before we start this project, we need to give thanks. And here's his prayer of thanksgiving to God. It's kind of long. Let me just read it to you. First Chronicles 29. He says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. He says, yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you. You're the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I, who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you. We've given you only what comes from your own hand. For we're aliens. We're like temporary residents in your presence as we are all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. But Lord, our God, all this wealth that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name, it comes from your hand. Everything belongs to you. Uh, this is David's prayer and really kind of a speech at the same time. Go, hey, God, you've done a great thing among us. All these people have given so generously, but let's be honest, uh, all that came from you, right? Our lives are good, right? We've been blessed and we know that you did that. Thank you that we're here. Thank you that we get to do this. We recognize the good that we have and we give you thanks. When you realize, okay, that God has given something good to you, when you realize that God has done something good for you, the moment you realize that is the moment to do what David does here, and that is to express it. They express it. Now, the Jewish rabbis taught that every item requires its own unique blessing, meaning on Thursday when you sat down for lunch or you sat down for dinner, um, everything around the table would need a specific blessing. You would say, okay, God, thank you for the turkey. Okay, God, thank you for the mashed potatoes. Okay, God, you know, when kids pray this way, we go, please get on with it, but they're doing it correctly. God, thank you for mom. God, thank you for dad. God, thank you for this toy. God, thank you. For you go through the whole list. Thank you for the rolls. Thank you for the sweet tea. Thank you for the pumpkin pie. That each item actually deserves its own individual blessing. Uh, they even argued that the blessing should be done before your food was digested, right? And if you should forget to do this, then the moment that you remember that you didn't express gratitude, you would have to go back to the place and the location where you were and you would say this thank you blessing. So you imagine that you all went out to dinner at Longhorn last night and you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't think we ever said a prayer. I don't think we blessed the food, did we? And they're like, oh, we didn't do that. When service is over, you go over to Longhorn and you go, okay, excuse me, can I just get in there for a second? It'll only take a minute. You sit down in that, on that seat and you do a thank you blessing to God for that. They had this saying, okay, which was, he who enjoys anything from creation, which is without blessing, commits misuse. So the attitude that they wanted to instill is that actually everything we have received is a gift in life from God. And to ignore the good gifts in your life was a form of theft. So be grateful, right? And say thank you. And there's no expiration date on being grateful. A few years back, I'm walking through the grocery stores. Late one night, I see a young lady who was, I'm guessing, about 20 years old. Um, she had only a few items in her cart, and she's just slowly, like very carefully making her way around the store. She's being very specific about the things that she looks at. She's taking her time to reach each, read each label that she, she picks up. And she, at the same time, had the most calm and content and what I would consider to be a grateful demeanor. And I noticed that she was being so particular, okay, because she was using WIC coupons. Now, if you don't know what that is... Uh, Essentially, WIC provides um, access to basic healthy foods for new mothers and children that we would say are in a bit of a lower income bracket. And here I am in the grocery store and I'm just kind of observing all this take place and I see what's happening. And I'm just overcome with like great emotion, like great empathy for, for, this, for this young woman. And, and yet she seems so happy. And I had this moment, right, like in the soda chip aisle right there where I'm going, okay, man, I, I remember that time in our life 
Like I remember, like we were so young and we were new parents and we had hardly, we had hardly any money. And, and I'm just saying a retroactive thank you for all of those years ago. And God, thank you for today. And you've been so good to us and you've been so faithful and you've taken care of us. And I'm going to go up there. I'm going to pay cash for this today. So God, thank you for all those years of providing for us. So I think sometimes there's this tendency in our lives to take good things for granted. You know, like we believe good is something that we deserve or we think that good is supposed to be normal. But when you find that God has brought you something good, right, you're experiencing something good, God has blessed you, then do what David did and express thanks. So if I can find thanks, then I can find joy. Let's think about giving thanks in bad circumstances. And I want to take you to what is likely Thursday before Jesus goes to the cross, okay? Just a few days before this, Jesus has entered Jerusalem. There's a really big party, right? A lot of adoring fans of his, and um, it's all part of the final events before the cross. On this day, one of his disciples has just made arrangements for his betrayal, in the evening, he's going to sit down with his disciples, right, his closest friends to celebrate the Passover meal. Now, the Passover is God's reminder, okay, that he has taken care of his people and it looks forward to the day when the Messiah would come as the perfect sacrifice for all the people. And Jesus is celebrating this meal, but he's also actually playing the main role and filling this greater meaning. He knows exactly what lies ahead of him while he's doing all this, right? Before the night is over, he's going to be uh, betrayed. He'll be arrested. He'll be denied by Peter. And eventually he'll be sentenced to be crucified. With all of that stuff in mind, okay, listen to his words in Luke 22. It says, then he took a cup and after what? Giving thanks, he said, take this, share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread and did what? He gave thanks. He broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the midst of what I would call the worst circumstances, he pauses to give thanks. Now we get a little bit of a clue, in my opinion, as to how that was possible if you fast forward to the book of Hebrews 12. I'll just read this for you. It says, let's keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, Jesus was able to give thanks in really dark times and do it joyfully because he was able to see something beyond that circumstance. Right? He's able to see that sin and death would be defeated and even people like you and I would have the opportunity to get into a relationship or find our way back to God the Father. So if you find yourself in bad circumstances today, I want to encourage you to do what Jesus did and find a way to hope in it. Okay, to hope in it. Several years ago, and a lot of you have probably experienced this as well, like my, my elbow was hurting and I was like, I don't know what I've done here. And it just, it started out really small and then just kind of got worse and worse. And it, it affected everything, everything I did. Okay, I, I try to tell my wife, listen, I cannot even carry that bag of groceries that hurts so bad. She didn't believe me, but I was like, well, listen, I'm gonna schedule surgery and then maybe you'll believe me. So that's what I did. I decided to have surgery to fix it. And I just remember actually on the front end still being excited about that. Like I'm excited about this even prior to the surgery and still in the midst of pain because I had a hope that relief was coming. Right? Some of you have done that before. Uh, even post-surgery, right? I, I was kind of thankful for the pain of recovery and even physical therapy because I knew that things were healing, right? Things are getting better. Now, listen, I have no doubt that you have some bad circumstances, some of you in your life right now. I just think about some of the things I've done um, with some of you in the last month or so, right? I've been to funeral homes and hospital rooms and doctor's offices, and I've sat with people who are are breaking up and people who are going through divorce and people who are experiencing lawsuits and cancer treatments. And I've talked with parents who like help us navigate. We're just kind of torn up with the choices our kids are making. And I understand, okay, that many of us are, are going through some really difficult times. So here's what hope says, all right? Here, here's what we're hoping in. All right, God, I wanna believe that even though this looks bad, 
I am believing that you can bring something good out of it. All right, God, give me, the, give me the strength to trust that though the situation looks dark right now, joy comes in the morning. In other words, okay, I feel like I'm literally down to nothing, God. I'm going to choose to believe that you're up to something. Like I have a hope, God, that you are working all things together for my good and to your glory. And I, I might not like what is happening. I'm not saying you have to like what is happening. But, God, I believe that you can do something beyond my wildest imagination. I may not even like what I've been given in this moment. But you can do a transforming work in my life through this. My circumstances are bad. But I'm going to choose to believe, God, that you're good. I have hope. That's hope. So if you find yourself in the midst of bad circumstances, would you ask God for the strength to do what Jesus does right here and hope in it? All right, say it with me loud and strong and we'll move on to the last part. If I can give thanks, then I can find joy. You're doing awesome today, by the way. Thank you for participating. I know you're anxiously waiting this one. What do you mean by give thanks in ugly circumstances? And when I wrote that down, all I could think of is like my favorite cheer in high school basketball, right? U, G, L, you guys know that one? L, Y, right? You ain't got no alibi. Um, When our kids were old enough to start driving, um, it was kind of like some of you are at that point now. It's like, it's a little bit, uh, uh, there's some nervousness to send them out there on their own. But like we embraced it. We're like, hey, while you're out, would you put gas in the car and uh, just get that thing washed and... uh, I remember the first time I made a special request, my two girls are out together and I said, hey, while while you're out, would you bring home some ice cream? I used to eat a bowl of ice cream every night and then I I heard that was bad for you. And so, uh, (laughs) will you bring home some ice cream? And here's what I'm hoping for. I am hoping for Blue Bell Happy Tracks. They brought home store brand ice milk. You guys know ice milk? Okay. It, it, wasn't, here's, it, it wasn't what I wanted, follow me, but it's still ice cream. Are you with me? I mean, you got something in your life that wasn't exactly what you wanted or what you hoped for, but it met your needs. And I think about Moses, okay, and the Israelites. Go all the way back to Exodus, specifically chapter 16. Uh, They've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but through the leadership of Moses, God's going to rescue them and promise to lead them into this very special land. They, They saw miracle after miracle of how God you know, proved himself to be powerful and how he was faithful. And, and now they're living in freedom, okay, and they're, they're on their way to this new land. And one of the things that God does to provide for them is to rain down bread from heaven. Like it's consistent. It is on time, never misses, always there. And then you read this really short phrase in Exodus chapter 16, verse 35. It says, the Israelites ate manna for 40 years. Now, here's the positive on that, okay, is that they never had to worry about where the next meal was coming from. I mean, talk about some advanced meal planning. Some of you are like envious right here. You're like, oh, that's amazing. But it wasn't what the people wanted. I mean, here's God. He's providing for their needs and the people are complaining about the food. Okay, that's great, but we really wanted something else. It even says that they were willing to go back into slavery just to have different food to eat. And we read that their offense against God was their ungratefulness. If you find, okay, that much of your life amounts to what we would call ugly circumstances, then I want to encourage you to do what those people should have done, and that is to receive it. Okay, to receive it. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is to to want what you already have. Okay, to want that you, what you already have. Um, a doctor by the name of John Cavanaugh is writing about one of his medical students. And he describes that she um, was finding herself drawn to an extended care hospital room for visits. And then she just kind of kept returning to the same person day after day after day. And the, the elderly woman had what he describes as some kind of a wasting disease And though she could no longer like move her arms or her legs, she would say, hey, I'm just so happy that that I can move my neck. When she could no longer move her neck, she would actually say to the young woman, hey, I'm just so glad that I can hear and I can see. And then when the young student finally asked the woman, well, what would happen if you lose your hearing and your sight? She said, I'll just be grateful that you, you come to visit me. And so often, like I I get there as well, like we, we want something different. I just want something better than what I have right now. I want to challenge all of us 
to just receive what we have. Hey, God, this is not what I wanted, but this is what I have. I'm going to choose to believe that it is enough. I'm going to receive it from you as a gift. You're going to walk out of here. You're going to go out to the parking lot. You're going to go, man, this car is ugly. I receive it as a gift. <laughs> hey, this house is ugly. I receive it as a gift. Tomorrow you're going to go, oh, this job is ugly. I receive it as a gift. My spouse is, ha, <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I receive them as a gift, okay? This situation I receive as a gift. It's all from you. Because when you can give thanks for the things that you have, I think that you'll start to want the things that you have and not the things that you don't have. Because if you can find yourself with ugly circumstances and do this, receive it, I think it will lead you to some joy. So when, if I can give thanks, I can find joy. When it's good things in your life, you express that things. When it's bad things in your life, you find a way to hope in what's on the other side of it. When it's the ugly things in your life, then just receive those as a gift from God. Uh, let me give you three um, next steps, practices on how to live a life of thanksgiving. And um, I wrote a lot of these for me, and I'm just going to share them with you. Is that cool? Here's one. The first experiment is to write a gratitude letter. Write a gratitude letter. Uh, you think of somebody who has impacted your life for good. It's a friend, teacher, coach. A mentor, boss, employee, doesn't matter what the relationship is there. An encourager, right? Somebody who um, has made you to be a different and I would say a better kind of a person. And you write them a letter, okay, uh, on why you are grateful to God for them. Give us some time, okay? Actually make it great. Make it legible. Then if you can... You call them up, send them a text and say, hey, can you meet me for coffee? Don't tell them what it's about. And then when, when they show up, you pull out your letter and you read it to them. And make a copy and, and give it to them, right? Do this face to face. Um, hey, this is why I'm grateful to God for you. Now, I wrote that down. I'm like, well, I'm not writing a letter. Uh, <laughs> I can't read my own handwriting, okay? What if we were to send a text? All right, and this will be a baby step for a lot of us. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone right now and we're gonna all send a text. And if you're like, well, I'm not doing that, we'll take out your phone and act like you're doing it. All right, so <laughs> if you take out your phone and you're like, you know what, who, who, who should I really just fire off a text to and say, hey, I'm thankful to God for you. Maybe they're sitting next to you. Maybe they're sitting around you right now. Maybe it's a, a parent or, or whoever comes to your mind and just, just, you know what, type in a random number and just send it. I'm thankful to God for you. See what happens. And don't send it to me, choose somebody else. Um, let's just take 20 seconds and do that. Just send a thank you text. I'm grateful to God for you and maybe just say why. And if you need to use me as an excuse, say, it's just this dumb thing we're doing at church right now. Just How cool that all kinds of people could be getting an encouraging word today in this moment. All right, so that's to write a gratitude letter. Here's the second one is to start a gratitude jar. That at the end of every day, um, you just write maybe on a small piece of paper one thing that you are grateful for and you drop it in that jar. That's it. Some days you might have a few things, other days might be a little bit more difficult. And then at the end of a month, or if you can make it to the end of the year, and then you just kind of empty that jar and read back over those things that you, you wrote down. And I think that you will find yourself thanking God again for everything that he's given you and what he's done in your life. So a gratitude jar. Here's a third one, is to uh, keep a gratitude journal. Now, all of the research, and there's tons about this kind of thing, uh, tells us that people who keep a gratitude journal for at least three weeks become happier people just by writing things down. So I would encourage you not to do this on your phone. I would actually really get like paper because when we write things down, we tend to slow down. Maybe just think about it, what you're putting down. Get a notebook, write down three things every day that you're grateful for. And it could be like low rung. It could be 
man, thanks, I'm on the wake up list today. Hey, thanks for family health. I had another birthday, a friend, right? My kids are in church today, right? Jesus, you can write down Jesus every day. I think that counts. Here's where science and the Bible actually agree on this, is that if you can give thanks, okay, you will become a more joyful person. So maybe try some of those things. So what, what are some steps maybe you can take to incorporate thankfulness into your life so that regardless of what's happening in your life, right? If it's good things, okay, I'm going to express that. If it's bad things, I'm going to hope in it. If it's ugly things, I'm going to receive it. Because if we can give thanks, okay, don't forget this part, in all circumstances, then we can find joy. So I think it's a great day for us to take communion together. If you have that or if you can find that, you know, we just read about this in Luke chapter 22 when Jesus is celebrating this meal with his friends, a meal that signifies freedom. He instituted this kind of practice. He basically just took elements that were common to every dinner. Okay, let me grab this bread right here. This is gonna represent my body. Let me grab this cup of wine. This is gonna represent my blood. This is broken for you. This is poured out for you. Right, for the forgiveness of sins, for what he's about to do on the cross that would provide you and I the opportunity to have relationship again with God the Father. So we're going to take that together this morning. While you do that, um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to respond in worship today. God, today we say thank you so much for Jesus. God, we thank you that through his example of expressing thanks in the midst of circumstances that just don't seem ideal. God, he was able to see to the other side of it. So God, we thank you for his sacrifice. God, we thank you for what we're receiving in this moment. God, I pray that it's just time for us to express our thanks back to you for the many blessings that you've given us in our life. God, for the amazing things that you've done for us and in us. God, I pray that this would just be a few minutes of, of deep gratitude, of thanksgiving. God, because you're active and you're present, you're working in our life. God, today we just wanna express our thanks. We just wanna say that we love you. We just wanna celebrate the great things that you're doing for us today. We want to give you the credit for that. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.